Okay. Hi, I'm Florian and welcome to my talk on naming conventions. And as Sylvia just said, uh, this is not so easy, especially not to have a talk about that, as I discovered a few days ago when I prepared this presentation. <laughs> but well, last talk of the day. Stay tuned, stay awake, and let's get started. What are we going to cover today? As I said, naming conventions. Specifically, we'll talk about principles, approaches, common practices, and overall system maintenance with a short QA session at the end, like in every talk here. And if you have any questions, um, just note them down in the mirror. We'll come back to you afterwards. I'm Florian Gampert, and I'm quite obsessed with tidy and well-organized design systems. And they have to be easy to use and fun to use for me. Names play a big role in this process. And in the recent years, I've built a few design systems, namely for O2, MediaMarkt, and currently for ProSieben Z1, as Sylvia just mentioned, which is quite cool. And for me, it's important not to only focus on the design side of things, but to bring designers and engineers closer together so that all, everyone forms a well-functioning unit. And yeah. This is also where names are going to come in. Sign systems have hundreds of entities, such as color palettes, typography, spacing, buttons, inputs, and so on, as you know. And the problem is as the system evolves and becomes more and more complex, it's important that everyone involved speaks the same language. And in regard, in regarding to, to language, we have our naming conventions. One of the most common challenges is that the components and the design tools do not match the implemented counterpart, like for example, in Storybook, but that's not all. For example, we have to look at the whole journey from the initial design draft through the implementation of the front end, but also check how it will be, for example, implemented in the content management system and be used there. Take this as an example. How would you name this component? Is it a banner, is it a message, or is it an alert? Well, like in our daily lives, I think that names matter. They're good names, they're bad names. Have you, for example, heard someone's name and immediately had a bad or good association with it? That's how it goes. And like in our daily life environment and culture defines what we think is appropriate, and ultimately also what is a good name. And the same is also true for naming components. So in this case, I think there is no right and wrong. It always depends. I would go for alert by the way, but that's just that. But luckily we can apply principles to make life easier and can go a long way. All right. What are principles for naming stuff in our design system? Principle one, it's logical. Good names are easy to remember. You don't want to have to look up the name every time you work with it. And you certainly don't want to use a dictionary to, and together with your design system to identify your components. Principle two is simple. Keep it simple. If names are too complex and can't be kept short, something else is probably wrong. Either the component is not generic enough or it already exists in a similar form and should be split into several ones. Don't go into too much technical detail with your names. For example, don't call this button awesome secondary button with thick outline. This is way too complex. You should take simplicity as a form of linter. So if it gets too complex, it's probably wrong. Principle three, make them scalable. Especially when it comes to token naming, scalable is important. So if you know that you will have other variants of something in the future, like for example, spacings or sizes or stuff like that, you should take this into account when naming the first variant. 
Otherwise, you will have to go back and change the original name to something like spacing largest test and so on. So keep it scalable. Don't do this. Principle four is standardized. The science system names should be standardized so that they can be used by all stakeholders. With stakeholders, I mean specifically like developers, Q&A, designers, analysts, what else you have like product owners, content managers. So everyone who works with the design system in any way should be able to identify components and names and stuff like that across all layers of the product. Okay, let's return to the initial example. Whatever you use, use a name for the same component. And so don't change up the names and try to use something that is widely accepted and understood. It, in the end, it depends on your use case what is feasible, in this case explicitly. So there is no right and wrong, as I mentioned earlier. So you could also take this um, example, the early one, and uh, name it banner, but check what your environment uses and make the best out of it. And please don't start searching for creative names like to name something like a standard button, standardize it, keep it simple, and keep it logical. So these are the four main principles in regards to naming. And if you apply these ones, everything should be understandable and you have this common language that you can refer to. So what are approaches we can take in regards to naming? At first, we have the concrete approach. This approach helps us to identify which component, uh, component is meant. So something like new teaser image, red text button, image with overlay, light gray divider, and so on. The big problem here is that if the underlying style changes, for example, if the red text button is now blue, we need to rename the entity to match the definition, and that's bad. We all know that once something is in code, the likelihood of someone going back and updating the name across all instances is quite low. And now we got a lot with a red text button that is actually blue. And this is quite confusing. Another problem with this approach is that it's subject to interpretation. A red text button does um, not really define the context in a semantic way. And you don't know when and how it should be used without looking up stuff in your guidelines. The counterpart to the concrete approach is the abstract approach. In this case, the name is not tied to the definition itself, and we don't have to update the definition as soon as something changes. The downside is that it's super hard to learn what the entity names stand for, so we need our dictionary again, and they have to translate everything. The approach I recommend is to start abstract and get more and more specific when you name your stuff in your design system. This way you combine the best of both worlds while having the flexibility for easy updates if they become necessary. So we have this pyramid. The lowest level of the pyramid is formed by values. Values are abstract names that come from the code, such as hex or RGBA values, absolute units like pixels or percentages. The next layer from abstract to concrete are base variables, like um, taking the initial variables, nesting them into um, uh, the, the, initial, yeah, the initial variables, nesting them, and they are still quite abstract, but are slowly becoming more and more concrete. These variables could theoretically also be used directly in components, but should not necessarily be used in that way. Because for this, um, we can use something like uh, tokens. So the uh, standard tokens um, are 
uh, again have nested base variables inside them and help you communicate intent to the one who uses it. Like here, color action. So we have our um, hex uh, or our, our, our GBA value, which gets nested into um, the base variable orange 200. And this variable again gets nested into our token, which is color action. And then we have component tokens. And these are matched to a specific component and in turn use a nested common token, in this case, color action. If it, um, yeah, and it takes the use case uh, in account. This also helps us to uh, make theming easy and overrides if we need them. In the end, it's on you to decide how far from abstract to concrete you want to strive based on your specific use case and whatever works best. Okay, cool. That's for tokens and tokens and variables. But what about components? In this case, we start the other way around. We start with the component itself named card. And in there are specific elements like the card image, card title, and card button with the state active. So this also works in this way. And if you have multiple instances of example for the button reduce the we reduce the concreteness and abstract it as for example uh, button primary active. So if we have multiple use cases for it, I mean this is the standard approach when working with components. Super important: don't overcomplicate things in the initial design phase. Don't block yourself by waiting to discuss names of the team. Take a placeholder or something you think is appropriate and tweak it later. Once you have a bunch of um, preliminary names, create a meeting with stakeholders from different worker areas, present your names for components and stuff. And I think it's important to include all opinions only at this stage so that you can uh, work fast and more efficiently. But you might ask yourself, how do you find common and understandable names? You know, when it comes to finding a system that works for your team's use case, everything has been done before and many elements have common names that are used quite often. I suggest consulting the common design guidelines of proven systems. Feel free to post your favorites in Slack or as I saw earlier, we have the mirrors, uh, mirror as well. Yeah, I think there's a page for it. Uh, or look at uiguideline.com. This is something that I actually first saw when Sylvia shared it on LinkedIn. And this is quite cool because the site compares the standard design systems and you see in which system, which name is used for which component. And um, if you have very specific components um, that don't have uh, matched to the standard name, try to abstract it and see if you can use a, a, a common component and maybe only make um, variants out of, if, out of it with your specific use case. What's a common notation that we could use when we are writing names? As components are developed later, you should try to find a common ground with your development team since ideally design and engineering should use the same notation. So check what the engineers are using, stick with it if it makes sense, if they have a notation for writing names and go as far as possible with it in your design workflow. I think it's important to value the engineers <laughs> and have to make their lives easier as well. And you do this by coming as close as possible together. Uh, in this case, I suggest to look into BAM. Um, BAM is, means block element modifier. This is a CSS methodology for creating reusable components. And this I found works also quite well with Figma variants to an extent. You just gotta check how extensive you can use it. And when someone now inspects your components in Figma, then they can go one-to-one -one with the same CSS classes check which component matches in the storybook, and um, this makes life easier for everyone. 
<clears throat> By the way, this also works in Zeppelin if someone still uses it. Um, going into detail here for BAM would be a way a bit too long for this talk, but it's super easy. You basically start with the initial component, the block with the previous example. It's card and then elements inside it get added to the main component or block name by two underscores, like card here image. And if you have a state of this component, you add the state with hyphen hyphen hover in this case. Um, when you have it in Figma, just ignore the initial part and use the state in your variant. <clears throat> Sorry. I gotta drink some water. Yeah, the life of a speaker is not okay. easy. What are general guidelines um, regarding the most commonly used types of components and tokens or namings in the sun system? Uh, quick disclaimer here. This always depends on your use case. And in the end, there's no right or wrong as mentioned earlier. So take all these guidelines with a grain of salt and check again your environment and what works best for you. So sizes. Uh, are often defined using t-shirt sizes. This makes it easy to scale them and keep them flexible. You should always start with medium as the default size. So if you have a button and only one button, start with it as the name medium. And then if you have a larger or smaller one, you scale it with large or small or extra small or extra large and so on. Um, I think you should not use short forms to make it better readable. So don't use XS or XXS, use XX small or X small. This is also easier to read in the code, in my opinion. And <laughs> earlier I heard that someone suggested using animal names, which is super clever for scaling. Uh, thanks for this idea. Um, this would be more on the concrete side of things on our previous scale, if you remember it. So from, from abstract to concrete, but Keep in mind, if you need so many sizes, for example, for spacings, there is probably something wrong already, in my opinion. So if there are lots of sizes, and if you really, really need them, so you should not be adding sizes later in the process if you, you set up your system correctly. Um, think about categorizing them. So you could have something like a section small spacing or section medium spacing and then a component small spacing. Um, then you can also go a bit more granular and don't need this huge spacing scale in this case. Colors should not be too specific or not too, too um, but not too abstract either. So keep them short. And I suggest not to use actual colors. This sounds a bit weird, but what I mean, don't call something color orange. Instead, keep them generic, so the colors in general, and a bit more on the abstract side of things. This also makes theming and changes way, way, way easier. Remember the blue button that is actually orange with the example earlier. Icons are super simple. I suggest grouping them into categories and add a specific name of them. That's it. Easy as that. Components get a bit more complex. Here, it's super important to keep them functional and understandable. So remember the overall process or the, the teams that were and the people that work in your team. Everyone should know what the component does based on the name of it. But don't be too specific. Also think about the editors and the content team if you have one. They also should understand which component they have to use if you are reading without reading an extensive guidelines or looking it up in your dictionary. And since we are going to talk about components a lot in our calls and meetings and so on, keep them pronounceable like navigation, navigation list, map, date picker. Keep it simple and remember the earlier principles. So now you know how to name stuff, but how do you maintain the system once you have one established? And I think the most important thing here is to do it together since a good system only works if everyone participates. Talk about naming in larger rounds. 
discuss it in detail, check what is commonly used and try to commit to it together. So for example, with my current team, I usually kick off the naming of our component in smaller refinement sessions with all the stakeholders involved that have a say on these things, um, mainly engineering and have a quick word on Slack about it. Next thing to maintain the system is to actually use it. So it doesn't help if you don't actually use it all the time. Always use the assigned names for the components during daily calls and conversations. And as soon as you start throwing in new similar names, or be, be careful to not to do it, but uh, better said, because it will cause confusion if you um, don't stick to one name that has been decided on. So let's speak one language in every situation. Document. <laughs> The design here is the worst nightmare, but come on, it's not too bad. Documentation in the end is a team effort. It doesn't have to be a boring conference page. In fact, I would advise against it. So document your naming system in a single source of truth and keep it as close as possible to your product team's daily workflow where everyone can access it. So for example, document your naming principles or naming process directly in Storybook or with the components, um, not necessarily in Figma since not everyone will look into it, but again, whatever works best for you. And do it together, use it in your daily chats, document it. Yeah, that's it. So summary, I think that a shared language for everyone using the design system helps to create mutual understanding, increases efficiency, and will in the end take your design system to the next level. And remember the principles from earlier, keep it logical, simple, scalable, and standardize it to make everything understandable in the end. Cool, that's it. And thanks for listening, you guys are awesome. And I think we can answer some questions. Great stuff, Florian, thank you. This has been really insightful. Thanks. And we definitely have some questions. Um, mm -hmm. I personally have a lot of questions, so <laughs> I'm just gonna start, yeah, <laughs> asking them. Sure, let's go ahead. Um, so, the problem I have with name conventions is that, sure, we, we can try to follow these patterns, but eventually you get uh, too many cooks in the kitchen, right? So then eventually you settle on some names and not it's not understandable to everybody. And so what do you do with legacy names? So like, how do you propose changes, if at all? Yeah, like, like everything in the science systems, at first check what names are being used, make an inventory and go through them. I think it's hard to change legacy names, especially when they are once, for example, also um, connected via your API in the CMS system and stuff like that. It's really, really hard to change these names. That's why it's important to make them right at the beginning, knowing it's not always possible, but try to do it, make an inventory, discuss it with the stakeholders involved and um, try to communicate how important it is to have a proper system and uh, the same components everywhere. Cool. And you mentioned pronounceable, like for components. Can you give an example of what you mean by a non-pronounceable one? When the name, for example, gets too long and you can't even finish it um, to, to pronounce it until the end. I had this case with some super weird teaser types with, which were so specific for certain use cases where you have this long component name and you can't even start to pronounce it. So keep it simple in this case and you stick with common names. Okay, I thought you were going more in the direction of like naming <laughs> something in, in Turkish or I don't know, <laughs> a different language. <laughs> I had not, uh, did not have this case before. But <laughs> I wonder <laughs> now that I think about it, how do they do design system in other languages? I don't know. I'm just so used to in English that I cannot even think about a design system in another language. Cool. Um, so um, we have a question: avoiding actual color names. 
What if you have seven brand colors? Seven brand colors in, in which case? So, yeah. I mean, this is like a quite standard uh, color palette uh, with seven brand colors. I mean, these colors should have specific use cases. So use the, the names as your, your wearable or a base token and nest them in something that reflects the use case. And if you mean by seven brand colors that you have seven different brands or you have something like a theming with also dark and light mode, um, that's where also these non-specific names come in handy. If you have something like primary color, it doesn't matter which uh, token or a variable is behind it because you can match it with your theming system. Yeah, um, one way that we included an additional color, we have primary and we have accent. So that's how we try to create a name that was generic enough and we could use the two colors simultaneously. Mm. I also like it how material design does it with primary variant. Um, you ne not necessarily have a brand that uses primary variant all the time, but uh, you can use primary variant for certain use cases and also be maybe not use it as a primary, um, primary color, but um, go a bit um, far away from it and name it something more generic, like you said, accent color, and then feel free to use it or not. Um, if you have a theme that requires it and keep it flexible. Cool. So, uh, well, actually the person just expanded on the question. So the example that uh, she gives is, uh, for example, two primary plus black plus white and mm -hmm. three other different colors, supporting colors. So currently they have blue, mint, mustard, lavender, peach, black, white, <laughs> and those are not connected with function. Okay, then I would think uh, go back a, a step and think how these colors are used again. If they are just random colors used on, on random components, there's no real system behind it. So maybe check how um, you could improve these things. If they are actually really random colors, you could, you could use a, a random variable and throw all these colors in there. If you go through it with it in your system, I'm not sure if this makes sense. Yeah. Um, let me think about it. Um, so you have a primary, you have a primary variant, then you could have a secondary palette with multiple colors that don't have to necessarily be tied to a certain use case. And then you can use these as specific overrides if you want to place them in your UI. But I, as, as I said earlier, I would really recommend to check how these colors are used in a certain way and establish a system with it. Yeah, it's certainly a colorful brand here. <laughs> All right, and who should have the last word? Uh, for example, if you can't get a common solution, and I would say between design <laughs> and development. Oh, uh, that's hard. I mean, it's a democracy, right? Do uh, you voting or something, or the one who's mainly responsible for the design system and uh, decides it in the end, but why not to throw in all the variants, have a quick quoting in Slack and be done with it. I mean, yeah. names are important, but not too important. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I think, I feel that in the end, the uh, designers have a, a stronger hand, <laughs> but the developers yeah. tend to do whatever they want to do anyway. So uh, yeah. Nah, come on. <laughs> I, know, I know these discussions and um, to correct myself, it's not always a democracy. Sometimes you need a strong hand in things. Um, but um, yeah, try to keep things civil and yeah. <laughs> start a fight or something. But um, this case should not happen too often. Otherwise, uh, look into your team structure. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And so um, also we have here, you mentioned a few times having design and engineer really close and well connected. And the person totally agrees. Mm. How have you worked on this and improved this relationship? For me, so I think this is not in regards to naming in this case, but for me, it's important to um, have small units um, that work closely together. So I like to um, not hand off my designs to the developments, but rather work with an engineer together or also code small things on my own. Um, because if you, you start your design, then you hand it over to development. Um, then the one who's building it will not feel involved. 
So if you take the one, and, and so the engineer, you work together and start with it from the initial phase to quick prototypes, maybe build stuff also directly in code. You don't need to go into variants of everything. So um, do it together, especially with animations. I think this, this will help a lot and make also things way faster. And um, this is also something in regards to prototyping what I personally don't really do is like these really high fidelity prototypes um, that you uh, saw in the recent years. I rather start building these things with the engineer together from the, from the start. So you also see how it will behave and in your use case it maybe not to this really polished state, but yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So taking a look at the time, we are, are at the top of the hour for the session, but uh, we do have a couple more questions. So if you can get a look at the mirror board and uh, when you have some time, just uh, go about answering it uh, if you sure. feel like it. Also sharing nice. any useful resources. Uh, if you could, uh, I think the, these uh, slides and explanation really uh, helps. Uh, and mm. um, to me, at least personally, I could definitely use it uh, as inspiration for mm -hmm. sharing this concept with my colleagues. Sure. It would be awesome to get uh, my hands on it, if you don't mind. No, not at all. I'll share it later and upload it somewhere. Cool. <laughs> yeah, great job, Dorian. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks, you you are a freelance designer. Are you looking for a new project? Not currently, but always happy to make <laughs> new contacts. <laughs> oh yeah, please check out Florian Gampat on LinkedIn. And, and thanks, thanks for this awesome yeah. practical session. It was really useful. And yes, thanks for the yes. awesome preparation. Really good job. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you had a very tough topic, but you, you did an amazing job. Thank you so much. Thanks, Soria. Thank and if you. Uh, See you ya. have any questions, just feel free to write me on LinkedIn or, or somewhere and we can have a quick chat and answer your questions if you have any. <laughs> Amazing. Cool. If you don't know how to name your component, just, just ping Florian. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> He's going to start receiving some images. people ping me. <laughs> But one year ago, Sylvia said, I can ping you anytime <laughs> if I don't know how to name my buttons. Yeah, involve me in your process and I will I'll pick names for your components. <laughs> AI based. Yeah, Slackbot. Florian. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Florian. Feel Thanks. Free to see you around. Ciao.